it's fair to say that most of us would prefer a world where things don't ever go wrong. But sadly, one of the consequences of life is that sometimes <laughs> happens. Or rather, beep happens, because YouTube will demonetize this video if I swear in the first few minutes. While it's true that we can't always prepare for every eventuality, plenty of data shows that when we practice what to do in an emergency, we remain calmer and act more rationally when things actually do go south for real. If we've practiced, even if it's just to the extent that we've thought about what we do in an emergency, we're much more likely to make smarter, safer decisions when our adrenaline is pumping and our heart is racing. It is, after all, why airlines go through the safety briefing before every flight, even if most of the people on the plane have likely heard it multiple times before. With that in mind, today's video is going to take the principle of thinking about how we'd act in an emergency situation and apply it to the world of electric vehicles, specifically accidents involving EVs. We'll discuss what to do if you come across or are involved in an electric vehicle accident, what you might and might not be able to do, and what comes next when it comes to repairing any damage your car has sustained. Before I get into today's video, just a little disclaimer. In addition to not being a legal or healthcare professional, I also want to acknowledge that every accident scenario is different, so any tips being shared today should be treated as general guidance and should be applied with common sense in each and every individual situation. Oh, and I'm sorry about the lack of decent B-roll for this video. Thankfully, there is minimal footage of accidents involving EVs, so we've had to become creative and generic. Short of going out and crashing an EV just for this video, which we can't actually afford, sadly, you're going to see a lot of generic car crash footage. Thanks, Storybox. To make this easier, I'm going to split this video into three sections covering the immediate aftermath of the accident, communicating with first responders, and then dealing with insurance companies. The first two are things you should think about before you're involved in an accident, while the last one is a series of tips that can help you navigate the process of getting back on the road as quickly as possible. So let's start with the first few moments after the crash and some common sense practices that apply to any accident. I'm going to paraphrase advice that's generally disseminated in plenty of other places and it revolves around making sure everyone is safe and stable. That's paramount. Stay calm and carefully assess the situation. If you're involved in the accident yourself, check yourself for injuries and then check everyone in your car for injuries. If injuries are minor and people are able to safely exit the vehicle, do so. But first, take a breath and make sure that you're not panic running onto a busy roadway. Check on the condition of everyone else involved in the accident, be they in another vehicle, on two wheels or on foot. Retreat to somewhere safe and bear in mind that adrenaline can mask pain. So even if everybody appears to not be badly hurt, keep an eye out for changing conditions and do encourage people to sit down if you suspect their injuries might be a lot worse than they think. Call the emergency services and if someone is unconscious, seriously injured or trapped, do not attempt to move them unless there is an immediate threat to their life by them staying where they are. Emergency operators will be able to advise you in that condition on next steps. If there's a motorcyclist or other vulnerable road user involved, such as a cyclist or pedestrian, it's usually best not to move them, even if they are conscious and seemingly mobile. Again, it is important where someone not in a giant metal box has impacted a giant metal box or indeed the ground, that they remain where they are until help arrives, as long as it is a safe place. And definitely do not go pulling helmets off unconscious but breathing bikers. If they are not breathing, then follow the advice from the emergency services, but call them before you do anything. Some newer vehicles will call the emergency services if they detect a collision or an airbag deployment. Either way, 
regardless of if you've called them yourself or your car has done it for you automatically. It's important to note that when you're speaking to the emergency operator, you should listen to the questions being asked and be calm. Relay all of the important information you have. Ideally, that should include a somewhat accurate location. And you should bear in mind that in many countries around the world, there are markers on the sides of major roads that can help you figure out exactly where you are. You should also, by the way, include a note that there's an electric vehicle involved if the impact was severe, since there are different responses required for internal combustion and battery electric vehicle collisions. Any advance warning you can give first responders that an EV is involved will be appreciated. The simple stuff out of the way, let's talk about EV specifics. In an accident involving an internal combustion engine vehicle, it's considered good practice to assume that if the accident has been severe enough, there may be a fuel leak and subsequent fire. In the case of an EV, the same risk of fire exists, but from the battery pack. It's worth noting, however, that unlike fossil fueled vehicles, where the rear of the vehicle traditionally houses the fuel tank and the front traditionally houses a hot engine and fuel lines that can easily break and catch fire, in an EV, the battery pack is housed usually between the front and rear axles, which can really help protect the battery pack in front and rear collisions. That said, however, in the case of a significantly large collision, a side collision, or an accident in which an EV has hit or driven over an object which has gone underneath the vehicle and could puncture the underside of it, potentially causing mechanical deformation to the battery pack, which in turn could lead to a short circuit, it is well worth bearing in mind that a battery fire is not out of the question. Luckily, most modern EVs will warn you if there's damage to the battery pack by displaying some kind of warning message in the vehicle, something most fossil fueled vehicles can't do if there's a fuel leak or some other issue with the vehicle that could ultimately result in a fire. If you are involved in a collision and your EV warns you that there's a battery pack fault, it is best to leave the vehicle and retreat to a safe distance, if everyone inside the car, that is, can be safely moved. That said, if there is any doubt about someone's injuries, they're unconscious, and the accident scene can be made safe, wait for first responder advice before doing anything else. Unless, of course, you start seeing signs of fire, like smoke, in which case evacuation of the vehicle takes priority. Thankfully, though, EV fires don't start in an explosive way like gasoline vehicle fires, so you normally have some warning that things are going south before things get bad. At this point, I'm sure that some angry folks are about to tell everyone in the comments how bad EVs are in accidents and how terrible battery fires can be. And if you want to see a video on us talking about battery fires, I'll link to it below. But it's also worth noting that battery fires are rare. Even in the event of a large impact, battery packs are designed to withstand crash impact energies and are specifically built to transfer the impact energy of an accident around the battery pack and around the cells rather than through them. This helps minimize the risk of internal short circuits. And as I just mentioned, they only burst into flames when the heat from the short circuit reaches a critical temperature. The initial aftermath taken care of, now it's time to discuss some common things you might note after the collision that's a little faster than a standard fender bender. Low speed accidents like fender benders are ones where you may not need to call emergency services, may be able to move your car to a safe place to exchange insurance details, and might even be able to go about your day afterwards but may still may require you to report it to your local authorities within a certain time frame. Just for your information. The first thing you might notice following an EV accident is that your car might not move under its own power, even if there's no apparent damage to the wheels or drivetrain. This is because many EVs have a physical emergency shutoff switch that activates in the event of a collision to safely disconnect the battery pack from the rest of the vehicle. It dramatically reduces the risk of any high voltage wires being alive in the moments post collision and keeps you, first responders and tow truck operators safe. Usually that requires resetting by the dealership or in some cases replacing of a physical piece of hardware within the car. So if your car doesn't work, don't be freaked out. 
Oh, and in case you are unaware, many internal combustion engine vehicles now have similar safety switches that prevent the fuel pump or injection system from operating following a collision for the very same reason. If your car has been in a big crash, that vehicle will do everything it can to make sure that the risks of anything going boom are as small as possible. Except airbags. They are meant to go boom. Of course, it goes without saying that you should power down your EV after an accident as you're getting out of the vehicle anyway, and that little switch may mean that the next time you try to turn it on, something won't work. Again, don't panic. It's designed like that to keep everyone safe. On the flip side, however, it's, it's also possible, like just any other modern vehicle, your EV may not behave as it should after an accident and things that should power off won't. Because every accident is different, let's assume that your car is safe, your car has been made safe, and anyone who's required medical attention has received it. As I noted earlier, even if no emergency services attend your accident, you are often required under local laws to inform both your insurance company and police of the accident, regardless of who is at fault. While you don't have to notify your insurance company or the local police immediately, it is generally required within the first 24 to 48 hours. Be sure to note down the time and the date of the collision, where it happened, and what happened. Take photographs if you can, and if it's safe to do so, and note the weather and road conditions, as well as if the police have been called. Be sure, if they have, to get relevant details from them that will help your insurance company pull the relevant police reports pertaining to your claim. Importantly, do not leave the scene of the accident until you've exchanged relevant insurance details with everyone involved, and everyone involved is safe. It's generally considered good practice not to admit fault at the scene of an accident. At least, your insurance company would rather you didn't, as that can complicate things down the road. On scene things taken care of, let's talk about next steps. It's well worth noting that electric vehicles can take longer to repair post-collision, if only because they're still made in smaller numbers than internal combustion engine vehicles and parts are generally a little more difficult to come by, especially as automakers are currently trying to put all of the spare parts into EV production. It's also worth noting that many insurance companies are more likely to write off an electric vehicle if there's any concern at all about damage to the high voltage battery pack. However, there is some good news here because Despite what you've heard from other news sources, data from the US Highway Loss Data Institute shows categorically that on average, around 18% of internal combustion engine vehicles are declared a total loss following a collision versus around 6.1% of electric vehicles. That said, it's also worth noting that insurance companies aren't usually okay with hanging around waiting for spare parts for extended periods of time. And if there is a massive wait list to fix your vehicle, or you happen to own an earlier EV that's no longer made, you may find your car is declared a loss for what feels like something relatively simple. There have been, after all, plenty of horror stories about new-to-market EVs getting written off because of a lack of spare parts or a lack of approved repair practices. So, as is usually the case, your mileage will vary. What is absolutely universal, however, is the fact that whoever's insurance is paying will likely want you to get your car repaired at their own in-house repair facility or a repair facility they've contracted with for discounted rate work. But while it's not universally the case around the world, most countries require insurance companies to let you choose a repair facility that your vehicle will be repaired at. This is particularly important when it comes to EVs, as while more and more accident facilities are now familiar with EV repair techniques, it's always worth getting at least a repair quote from a repair specialist associated with the specific make and model of vehicle you have, and be willing to argue for that repair specialist with the insurance company if you'd rather have them work on your particular EV. A few weeks ago, while I was trying to get to the airport to fly down to San Diego for the day, I sleepily managed to back my Ford F-150 Lightning into a retaining wall on my property. I didn't do that much damage to the wall, and the only thing to get damaged on my truck was its rear bumper. It was about 
$1,200 worth of damage. However, my insurance company was more than happy to work with me to get my truck repaired at my local dealer operated repair facility that was familiar with and happy to work on EVs rather than its own in-house repair company. As for insurance companies, well, it is unfortunately a little late after an accident to learn that you picked the wrong one. It's always worth shopping around when you renew your auto policy to make sure that you pick a policy that's right for you. Oh, and because I've known people for whom this is true, if you are someone who uses your car for work or perhaps does some moonlighting at the weekend for some extra money from gig economy work, make sure you tell your insurance company. You really do not want to learn post-accident that you are somehow underinsured or not insured at all. At the end of the day, it's worth remembering that while an EV can ultimately be fixed or replaced, you cannot. And while you can't foresee all eventualities, working to become a more alert and attentive driver or rider is ultimately going to help you avoid many of those accidents in the first place. So ditch your mobile phone, increase your following distance and remain an active rather than a passive road user. Practice what to do when things aren't going your way and you may find that you can avoid the accident altogether. I'm going to link below to some great videos about becoming a better driver and a better motorcyclist that should help. Thanks for joining me today and if you've got thoughts make sure you leave them below in our Discord chat room or you can reach out to us on Mastodon. Thanks to the amazing list of people scrolling by on your screen right now. They are some of the more than 1500 people who help fund this channel through Patreon and YouTube, covering our bills, paying our team and making sure that we can be 100% independent. If you'd like to join them and see your name listed here, just follow the links below. There's a range of different tiers you can sign up for, from as little as $1 a month, or if you pay yearly, just under $11 a year. A huge welcome to our newest supporters, David McConnell, Dennis Lyon, James Cardelli, Bennett Yee, Bigfoot Research, Ben Dradel, Stuart Jocelyn, Cole, Chayfilla5555, Charles Stanton, Daniel Snyder and Scotty. Thanks for all becoming part of the TE crew. If you'd like to support us with a one-off donation, you'll find links below to make Kofi and Bitcoin donations and we even have an old-fashioned PO box you can reach us at. We'll throw in a link to the address below. And if you're in need of some swag, you'll find our swag store in the down below too. We've got some great content coming up, so make sure you're subscribed on Peertube or YouTube and we'll see you soon. We make new videos every Monday, Wednesday, Friday, Saturday and Sunday. If you want more, the mighty algorithm thinks you'll like this video, but we think that this one is also well worth a look. See you soon and as always, keep evolving.